You're a line dog face pony soldier. Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. That's Joe Biden. I'm joined because it's Mondays with Mike by Mike Allen of Axios AM. He leads Axios AM this morning with the announcement from the Bloomberg campaign of many insider details and the declarative. You know, I think Mike Allen is definitive. So he finally declared Pete Buttigieg the winner of Iowa. I did yesterday because he got 14 delegates and Bernie got 12, and those are the rules. Uh, Mike, is everyone else accepting that Pete Buttigieg won? Of course not. And you saw that both Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg have uh, claimed a victory. I was in New Hampshire at the end of last week, and there's so much Pete momentum there. You really see it. You would uh, there scroll down in Axios AM to the third item. You you'll see an astonishing picture of a Pete rally, just massive. And somebody sent me. I'm just talking into the speaker on my phone because I'm just looking for uh, the picture. Somebody uh, sent me a picture from another uh, Pete rally yesterday. So a lot of excitement about Pete in New Hampshire, uh, but the, there's so much still uncertainty about these Iowa results. So lead story of the New York Times, two columns, a big uh, splash, like they dug into a little bit of an autopsy on Iowa. And what they found was, one, it was not just the app, that these problems went back months, and some had foreseen them. Second, one in six of the uh, precincts has irregularities in their math, and they think that one in ten of the precincts, they have misallocated their delegates. So, Hugh, I don't think anyone will ever believe this result. Well, you know, to a certain extent, it's the same as when Rick Santorum beat Mitt Romney, but he didn't beat Mitt Romney because Mitt Romney won. Pete Buttigieg won 14 delegates, and we move on. And I'm looking at this picture of the mayor at Salem High School in New Hampshire, which is a Jim Borg Reuters photo that you referenced over at Axios. And, uh, by the way, I think the uh, staffer of the year— is going to come down to an, a, a playoff between Liz Smith, who is Pete Buttigieg's comms director, and Brad Parscale, who's running the Trump campaign. They're both kind of evil geniuses. I love Liz. She she taunts me all the time, says Mayor Pete's coming back on my show, and then he never shows up. But she's done an amazing job. I mean, he's the mayor of South Bend, Mike Allen, and he's electrified a full 25 to 35 percent of the Democratic primary electorate. Well, you're right. Just making your point. He's the former mayor of South Bend uh, now. And that's right. And part of it has been uh, this strategy of being ubiquitous, of of going on everywhere, everything. Uh, Another reporter was telling me that they were going to do a CNN hit last weekend, and there there was Pete Buttigieg who had done his um, uh, hit, like making himself available. And that's what works. In these early states, oh, I got to tell you though, I, I, I've in, I've invited Liz a hundred, maybe two hundred times uh, via DM, and she keeps. Uh, he, he did the show once, and she says he'll keep coming back, and he doesn't want to come near anyone a second time. He immunizes himself against the idea that he doesn't do center right media, and then or conservative shows, and then, uh, but he does it once, and so he's immunized. I want to talk about Donald Trump's tweet just now because the president of the United States just tweeted. The troll in chief says, we'll be in Manchester, New Hampshire tonight for a big rally. Oh, how he just screws with the Democrats. Want to shake up the Dems a little bit. They have a really boring deal going on. Still waiting for the Iowa results. Votes were fried. Big crowds in Manchester. I got to tell you, he never misses an opportunity to gig him, Mike Allen, ever. Yeah, uh, uh, this is a great one. Uh, You definitely a breaking tweet of uh, the president. 6.28 6.28 uh, a.m. on top of it. But uh, you've seen this in other states. You saw uh, Vice President Pence and the president going into er- other places where Democrats were having uh, debates and contests. So uh, this is going to be a, a – we're going to see a lot of fun pictures of the Trump rally versus these other candidates' rallies. The Trump rallies are so extraordinary that now TV stations – are running aerial pictures of them. So the president's recent rally in New Jersey, there was 
these massive crowds outside. And I think that uh, the Trump campaign loves having people outside because you can uh, get these aerial pictures. But the fact that the Fox, the local Fox chopper, who was taking pictures of the Trump line shows a little bit what's happening. The uh, uh, Buttigieg campaign, uh, Liz Smith, uh, you mentioned before, is a senior strategist, is a, a media guru, uh, tweeted a picture yesterday of the Buttigieg overflow. So they're picking up uh, on that uh, on that uh, trick. And uh, Tim Murtaugh, uh, the Trump campaign's communications director, uh, tweets back, how cute. Yeah, well, highest form of flattery. Let me switch to overseas. There's coronavirus and there's German shakeup. Uh, Angela Merkel had designated uh, an heir apparent. It's supposed to become the uh, the head. Uh, uh, Karen Bauer is her last name. Angela uh, Kauer, Karen Bauer, I can't remember, Krauser Karen Bauer, who said today, I'm done, I'm out, I'm not going to do it. Uh, this probably means Jan Spens becomes the, Rick Grinnell's buddy, becomes the new leader of the, the German uh, center right, but we're not sure. And it's the major NATO ally after Brexit is done and the UK has walked away. Germany is in chaos. And now we find coronavirus spreading through Europe. How much troubles Europe in? Well, uh, you've teed it up, uh, nicely and, uh, just em- embedded and embedded point, uh, there, uh, Rick Grinnell, the president's ambassador to Germany is among his most trusted, ambassadors people think of him as sort of the voice of europe and so uh that uh that uh, change is is fascinating that is great context for that and hugh the virus still underestimated the possible effects of that still underestimated what will happen if it moves around more in the united states and we have a fascinating uh, stat at the top of axios AM today, just looking at the effects on the global economy, and uh, the virus by itself has put a stop to 43 quarters of, so what is that, that's four years, right? Uh, 43 quarters of um, global growth. So it's uh, a, a decade of global growth, and it's all because of uh, an estimate that uh, the global economy will lose $280 billion in Q1. Part of that is the nightmare, Hugh, for tech manufacturing. The supply chains we've, are so deeply embedded in China, and we're just beginning to appreciate that, realize that with the virus. People have been paying too little attention to that. We're now seeing it in a very vivid way. I, ju- I just read Steve Schwartzman's book, What It Takes, the, the founder of Blackstone, and he always looked at a crisis as – Where's the opportunity in the crisis? So I was looking at that, and it will be with people like Amazon who uh, take advantage of home delivery. People don't want to go out into the mall and things like that. But also people who specialize in supply chain disruption. I happen to own some shares in Secure Space, which is a startup that helps people deal with that. So I'm very happy from an economic perspective, but I'm very alarmed because of a story in the South China Morning Post this morning. And I don't know if you read that, Mike, uh, of two escapees from the coronavirus quarantine. And I believe that there are, you have a corrupt communist party that takes bribes and you have a a bunch of ideologues who wouldn't mind to export the virus elsewhere in order that the panic be generalized and not focused on China and that the GDP loss not be suffered proportionally, disproportionately by China. We have a a bad Tinder-like situation for an explosion of a virus, but Science is on our side like it wasn't in 1918. They're going to be able to identify the antivirals that work pretty quickly. When does Axios move to having an entire newsletter devoted to coronavirus? Because I think that uh, the New York Times has done it. The Wall Street Journal has done it. The Telegraph has done it. uh, South China Morning Post has done it. When is Axios going to do it? So uh, Axios has been uh, early and heavy on the coronavirus. Uh, coverage. We've relaunched our China newsletter, Axios China, which uh, I would encourage your uh, listeners to sign up for. It's once a week. It's fantastic coverage, and it puts into perspective uh, these massive changes as the number one economy, the U.S., becomes the number two economy to China. So we've been looking 
uh, coronavirus there. And then in addition to that, uh, we have a science staff, including a reporter who specializes in uh, epidemiology and pandemics. So it's all part of the Axios idea of looking ahead, of, of keeping you up on the trends that are going to shape the next five years and economically, socially, medically, the coronavirus is going to have such incredible ripple effects. Did you ever read The Great Influenza by John Barry? I do. It, it, not only it's for your reader, for your listeners, not only is it eye-opening, illuminating reporting, but it's amazing writing. It's one of the best written books of our lifetime, worthy of your time in any season, but especially now to give you perspective about why you should care about the coronavirus. The Can you imagine if you'd been a reporter in 1918 who had the story? It, like, If you were the Axios of 1918 and you dove deep into it from the beginning, you would win every Pulitzer, you would be doing the world a great service, but nobody covered it because of the Wilsonian authoritarianism at the time, press, press censorship and, and uh, throwing people in jail. Wilson was a genuine authoritarian during World War One. No one got the real story on the virus. I think Axios has an opportunity here, which it sounds like you guys are already taking last 30 seconds to you, Mike. Um, I, I, I don't think we're anywhere near uh, peak coronavirus coverage. What do you think? No, we'll, we'll put aside the coverage. We can see that the effects of it uh, are uh, spreading, and it's illuminating issues like she's control and how are they handling it. What was the misinformation? What was the suppression of the information early on, and what were the consequences of that? Uh, those are all uh, questions, great questions about this regime worth asking now exposed. Mike Allen, always a pleasure. Thank you for joining me. Follow him on Twitter at Mike.